right away. So um, getting started, um, we're going to start uh, this presentation by providing an overview of the DRS along with what's changing and why. Um, we'll go over some important employer reporting terms, including some new ones uh, that you'll be seeing in the new system. Uh, we'll talk primarily about active uh, member data reporting, and we'll go over the ins and outs of that process, as well as remitting uh, contributions and submitting your vouchers. Uh, we'll have some information on setting up accounts, as well as other related topics throughout the presentation. Um, the uh, concluding slides have some resource links to uh, phone numbers, websites, emails, etc. Um, and um, for you to hold on to as needed. Um, this presentation is, is intended as an overview uh, to bring you up to speed on the basics of navigating the new system and on some of the key changes. We will be providing additional written and hopefully recorded instructions um, on specific pieces as we uh, begin using it for real in a couple of months. Uh, as you know, each month employers uh, send your send data to NHRS for you know monthly uh, wage and contribution information for active members. Uh, the integrity of this data is is crucial uh, for our ability to administer retirement benefits. The slide shows some of the things uh, that we need it for, um, all sort of equally important. Um, and we do truly appreciate all your efforts uh, to report this information to us as you have been doing for many, many years now. So one question we get is why is the DRS changing the data reporting system? And, and uh, it's part of a larger project and HRS is in the midst of updating its uh, pension administration database, which is a product known as Pension Gold. Um, this is uh, the DRS piece is a component of pension gold. If you think of a, an iceberg, the public part that you see out, outside is the uh, employer DRS, and then there's all kinds of stuff under the water that we use the program for to do things at NHRS. Um, the current version that we're using is uh, coming up on being 20 years old, which is a very long time to use any piece of software, even with you know upgrades and patches along the way. And, and it was really just, time at this point to um, do an upgrade so um, that's that's kind of why it's changing now the the overall project started over four years ago um, staff has been working with the vendor since january of 2019 on um, programming development testing etc on this and now that we're in to the summer of 23 uh, we're rolling out some employer uh, training on it um, what we're looking to do is something called parallel processing beginning in October and November of 2023. We sent out some emails about this several months ago, but basically what we're looking to do in October and November is have the employers uh, report their monthly information in both the current version that you're using today and in pension goal version three. So we're actually I, we're asking you to kind of double up on, on what you do for an HRS for a couple of months. And, you know, other than our sincere thanks for doing that, there's not much we can, we can offer you other than our appreciation. Um, the reason we're doing parallel processing is to ensure that all employers are able to report correctly in pension goal version three, the, the new um, system before switching over to it completely to make sure it's doing all the new system is doing all it's supposed to on the internal side about benefit calculations and the like so that we know that you know the system is is working accurately and there, there weren't any issues that weren't identified in prior testing that we're going to have to deal with so it's it, sort of the shakedown cruise of, of doing where we're also doing this internally is entering everything in both systems and then constantly cross-checking to make sure there's no uh, bugs is what Parallel is all about in October and November. And then we're looking to go live with the new system only on December 1st. Uh, that will become the system of record, so you'll only be using version 3 going forward and um, you know submitting your information there. Um, during parallel processing, we're going to have links to both the new uh, system and the old system on our, our DRS um, quick link page 
on the on the homepage of nhrs.org and we'll mark them clearly so you know which one you're you're clicking on they're going to look very different too in terms of an interface so it, it's pretty obvious um one other thing we want to mention on this slide and we're, we're we're getting down to a smaller and smaller pool um but if anyone on this um webinar who has not been able to submit an XML test file to NHRS with the new uh, file layout for version three, please please do so as soon as possible and, and um, reach out to Joy about that. We'll have her contact information later on in the slides. So here are some big differences between um, pension goal version uh, two in version three. And why six? Well, six fit on the slide, but actually these are the most um, <laughs> the most significant changes. So uh, starting out, new hires will now be reported through the file or via web entry. So you won't need to do those paper enrollment forms anymore uh, beginning in December. And we'll talk a little bit about more how the um, electronic enrollment is going to work towards the end of this presentation. Uh, similarly, terminations will now be reported through the file, um, so you won't have to do those lovely paper term forms um, that you get so many of over the summer when all your teachers retire on July 1. Um, in the new system, you'll have the ability to view and clear multiple exceptions at one time. Um, pay periods and pay dates will be set up for each employer by pay frequency. Uh, for schools, uh, we're also going to have this the same page where these schedules are listed. We're going to have um, teacher contract period information as well. Oh, that's actually number five. I should have read that before I said anything. Um, and that the idea of having the contract information uh, will hopefully reduce exceptions related to summer payments, balloon checks, you know, et cetera. Um, and also ultimately make it easier for teachers to estimate their benefit because that those funds paid in over the summer or, or applied to the right year for them. Uh, and finally, the payment voucher fields will be automatically populated with the dollar amounts from your posted reporting. So once you submit your file, clear any exceptions if there are any in the file posts, and you go when you go in to to um, send send the uh, payment to NHRS. All that's going to be pre-populated for you, so you don't have to rekey all of that in in the voucher or save the voucher the way you do now. It's all automated and saved. So here are some of the terms we're talking about uh, today. Um, the green ones are new terms in the new system. So I'm going to focus on those right now. There is a, a glossary of all these terms in, in, as well as others in that uh, resources uh, page link that I dropped in the chat a minute ago, and I'll, I'll drop it back in towards the end if anybody joined after we started. Um, and so PGV3, that, that's how we describe the new pension administration system. We're using Pension Gold in its version 3. Um, we don't tend to use that um, you know, in our written materials, but we've been saying it so long and so much in the building. We know it's going to slip out when we're talking to you on the phone uh, to troubleshoot. So when we say PGV3, we want you to know what we're talking about. Um, next one here is batch card. I, you know what a batch is, and, and batches really haven't changed um, dramatically in the new system in terms of conceptually how they're used. But batch card is an, is an icon in the new system where you can see your most recent batch or batches, and um, there's a little drop down menu associated with the card where you can go and do, di do different tasks associated with that batch. So it's a quick way to get to where you need to go. Uh, trial is a new term. Right now we have two processes that run when you submit a file to us, the um, file validation process and the, and the uh, file edit process. And trial is basically a combination of both those processes in one. So, um, you know, it, it's a little more efficient. It catches more things in one pass through than having to go through both of those uh, screenings. Uh, which are automated in the current system. It will be automated in the new system as well, but um, it's a twofer. Um, subgroup, this is the way um, 
the term for the way you would describe which plan your members are enrolled in, teacher political subdivision, employer political subdivision, stuff like that. So that's just the, the terminology of subgroup is new. Unscheduled batch, this is something new and, and somewhat excited. This is us exciting. This is where you can create additional unscheduled batches outside of your regularly scheduled monthly batches to uh, do things like report your salary continuance payments and, and other things. And there's a slide uh, towards the end that Joy is gonna give more of a description of how the unscheduled batches work. Tier, uh, this is a new way, a new or more accurate way to refer to the varying benefit levels uh, that uh, a member is in, uh, you know, the vested by and uh, hired by indicators in the current system. Those check boxes are going away and all members are going to be identified by a tier. I'll show you what those look like on the next slide. Um, but just the last item on this page, teacher contract info. Um, this is new as well. This is a con contract information um, card is available on each, mem each member's screen. And this allows for um, employers to add contract begin date, contract end date, contract salary, pay period frequency, et cetera, um, whether it's job share. So this this is information we're not capturing now that um, will hopefully make it easier and reduce exceptions as we go forward down the road. So tiers. Uh, Talked about the you know the the way we describe members now we say you know the member was in service prior to July 1st of 2011 and not vested prior to January 1st of 2012 it's a bit of a mouthful so um, in the new system we're kind of streamlining that uh, referring to members as being in tier A B or C um, there are a handful of members you, you may not have any in your employment uh, who were hired after 7-1 of 11 and became vested before 1-1 of 12, typically by age. So you may see a tier AC indicator, the benefit provisions are slightly different for those folks, but um, you know the, the bulk of people are gonna either be tier A, B, or C. Uh, this is what the new um, login for the uh, DRS is gonna look like. Um, during parallel processing, as I mentioned, we'll have links to both versions of the DRS on the website. And once parallel is complete and we go live, uh, we'll remove the links to the old uh, DRS system. But this is what it's going to look like when you come to the page to um, log in. Once you log in, you're going to see something new. Uh, it's sort of a, a dashboard, if you will, on the uh, on the login page, it shows recent recent batches, employer account information, communications, things like that. It's it's uh, pretty big for a small slide, so we're, we're breaking it down into three sections, and we're going to walk through those on the next um, couple of slides. So the menu bar uh, with all the commands in it is on the left side of the page, just as it is in the current system. Color scheme is a little different, and, and some of the uh, the links and the tasks that you have here are different than what you're used to, but it's in the same place. So when you cut that bar up and kind of walk through the, the highlights of it, uh, in the employer account section, um, you can view uh, your account summary and balance, submit payments and vouchers, uh, request refunds if you think there's, if, if you've made an overpayment, uh, request a waiver on a, a late penalty if, if you're assessed one, uh, things like that. So, and then in the employer reporting section, which is right below it, that's sort of the one you're probably going to be hitting most often. Uh, you can create, edit, and submit your monthly files, correct any exceptions, check and update your annual pay sections and teacher contract parameters set up a job share position for uh, teachers sharing a full-time position if you have any of those. Uh, the tier lookup tool, if you've got a new hire coming in and you're not sure you know, which tier they're in in terms of earnable comp reporting, uh, you can use that tool to look up one or multiple um, members. And um, upload documents, this is a new feature rather than emailing us um, documents. Um, you know, related to specific members, you can upload them through the DRS and, and give it a couple of examples of where that will be uh, useful um, in a little ways down into the presentation.
you'll notice that retiree reporting is part of the um, the main employer reporting menu in this version of the DRS. It was a separate module. You had to toggle back and forth between it uh, in the current system, but you know it's um, it's all in one menu here on this system. Again, still only reporting that once a year. Um, so we will be training on on the retiree reporting, um, you know, in December and January of this year. The the good news about that is that this those processes are changing the least of anything uh, with our transition to the new system. It's the same file layout, um, you know, the grandfathering is going to look different, but you know, the the checking it is going to be very similar. So um, you know. If, if 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 you've mastered the monthly reporting, uh, retiree re reporting is going to be easy peasy for you. Um, account adjustments is a section. This is where you can fix certain errors in a member account. Um, do your salary continuous continuance if there were erroneous contributions. Uh, you you could make that adjustment there and salary pay item correction. This is if you put the money in the wrong bucket, you reported comp over base for someone where it should have been reported as base, stuff like that. You can move the amounts between the buckets here. Um, you know, Joy will talk about account adjustments um, towards the end of the presentation and give a little more detail on that. Um, finally, the report section. You can run, run various reports to help identify any errors and validate the information contained in the batches. Uh, there's a list of some of the key reports towards the end of the presentation that we have. Um, contact us links and then the uh, help menu. It's it's pretty robust as a help menu, so that it's it's a very good sort of starting point if you if you run into anything, or if you want to kind of just browse it ahead of time um, once once you have access to it. Um, Definitely recommend checking out the help menu. And we move to the middle of the page. Um, under the reach re, in the recent batches box, you're going to see um, the status of your current batch, uh, whether it's submitted an error, corrected, rejected, posted, what have you, as well as your next scheduled batch or any unscheduled batches that you set up. Um, so. The uh, little squares, the gray squares, that's what I'm, we're talking about when we talk about a batch card. And you'll see that schedule batch has a um, drop down menu on it. So you can do things from there. And the, the batch is our, the active batches are also color coded. Um, so you'll know if it's, um, you know, if there's errors with it, if it's been posted, et cetera, or it's, you know, the you know, red light, yellow light, green light kind of thing. But um, again, sort of a quick visual reference for you if you log in and, you see it's a green, that's good news. Um, the employer communications is where it's going to have a running list of any notifications generated by the system uh, related to your account or reporting batches. Uh, you'll get an email when a new communication is available here and you can click on those um, to, you know, if you have exceptions or you know, have to file posts, that kind of stuff. Uh, those will all be here. There is a little filtering tool uh, the, the funnel and the green line there, um, where if you are a larger employer and you have multiple people doing different parts of the monthly reporting, you can filter out which um, notifications you really need to see and, and not get the other ones or, you know, or you can you can keep track of all of them, however you want to manage that, but you have a little flexibility. But the default out of the box will be, um, you'll be getting everything uh, that, associated with your account uh, there. Uh, moving over to the right hand side of the page, uh, the employer account section displays your next reporting due date, uh, any outstanding balance, your last payment date and amounts and your next payment uh, date if known. Um, so just again, quick reference stuff. Associations, this is a section of the the dashboard that lists all the folks at your employer who have access to the DRS for for whatever reason. So you know if you see somebody on there who doesn't belong, we can take them off. If you need to add somebody, you know we can get them added. Um, so that's that's associations. The other tabs, if you have multiple funds, uh, multiple plans. If you're an SAU with multiple districts, for instance, on your report as separate plans, you can toggle back and forth between you know 
this district and that district under the plans tab. So I think that brings it to the end of my section of the presentation. I'm going to turn it over to Joy Tardif now, but if you have any questions about sort of that overview, again, please type them into the chat and we'll we'll tackle them. Um, and if not, I'm going to turn it over to Joy. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to start um, to speak to the overview of reporting by file upload. So when you report by file upload, you would extract your data file from your payroll system. You would then submit it through the DRS and you would be notified by email if the file contained any exceptions or if the file is rejected. And you will also receive a notification after posting is complete. This chart shows a simplified version of the process a file goes through once it has been reported to New Hampshire Retirement. You'll notice on the left hand side is where the employer steps are and on the right side of the line is New Hampshire Retirement steps. So it starts off with the employer submitting the file. It then goes through our trial process, which is where your exceptions would be identified. And then either you have exceptions or you don't. If you do not have exceptions and it's error free, it would go to the post process um, during the next trial. But if you did have exceptions, you would receive a notification that you had exceptions. You would have to review and fix or clear the exceptions. And then it would go back to the trial process once you marked them as corrected. And obviously, if you had no more exceptions, it would go to the post process. But if a few more popped up, you'd be notified again. And it just kind of works in like that circular fashion, um, essentially like it does now. When you report by file upload, you'll extract the XML data file from your payroll system and submit it to DRS. As you are aware, um, we have been reaching out to employers asking to send in test files um, to validate. If you have not yet submitted a test file, uh, please speak with a New Hampshire retirement representative after the presentation. Um, essentially, it could be me. <laughs> when, uh, when parallel processing begins in October, if you submit a file through the new DRS and have issues, be sure you are using the correct file schema and contact your payroll vendor or IT staff for help. Uh, we will have the PGV3 schema available on the New Hampshire Retirement website, but if you continue to have issues, you can contact us at NHRS. When it's time to submit your file, you'll click the Submit Reporting File button in the menu. It will take you to the following screen. You would click browse to locate the file on your computer and then you would click the submit button and that would submit your file through the DRS. Um, you'll notice that the validate XML schema box is automatically checked. So you don't necessarily need to validate your file separately in the new system. However, if you are like in the habit of using the standalone validation application before submitting your file, the application will still be available for you to download and use. If you get a notification that your file has rejected, it means that there were errors found during either the file processing or file edits, which essentially now is called the trial process. There are many reasons why a file might reject, and some of the common reasons are listed on the slide. If your file rejects, you can actually now overwrite it by uploading a new corrected file. Um, as you know, currently, if you have a rejected file, we have to delete it and you wait on us sometimes. But in this circumstance, um, you just would upload a new file and it overwrites it. Here's an example of a notification you might receive if you have a rejected file. This one in particular is a batch number is not valid or active. And what that means is that the batch number being used has already been processed. This can happen if you reuse a prior month's batch or if you key in a wrong number. 
And here is another example of a rejected file notice you might receive. This example is for exceeded threshold tolerance. And what that means is that 35% or more of the file contained exceptions. When you have that large of a percentage of exceptions, it's basically telling you that you have a problem with the file itself. Reporting exceptions are errors that are identified in a file during the DRS editing process. If you have any exceptions in your file, you will receive a notice. And just to reiterate again, that 35% or more of the total records in a file have errors, then the whole file will reject. Uh, files must also be posted and free of exceptions by the 15th of the month in order to avoid penalty. Here are some examples of some common exceptions that you might have and that you would have to clear. We will be providing step-by-step -step instructions on how to clear some of the most common types of exceptions, and that will be available by the start of parallel processing in October. If you receive an email that your file has exceptions, you can view the exceptions by logging into DRS. And then from there, there are two different ways that you can get to your exceptions. The first is if you go to the menu bar and it's showing it to you on the left side of this slide, um, and you would click on the exception that's circled and it would bring you to your exception list. Or on the right side of the slide, you'll see that there's a batch card with a little arrow. If you click that arrow, the little box that says correct exceptions pops up and you would click on that and it would bring you to your exception list. To view and correct the exception, you would click the review button to the left side of each exception. You'll notice that there is a delete button next to review. Um, we just wanna make sure we note that you don't wanna delete there um, unless you're certain that you're meaning to because you could uh, by accidentally remove that member completely from your file. Did my mic just mute out on you guys? Yes. Where did it? I'm so sorry. I don't know how that even happened. <laughs> I wasn't even on my mouse. <laughs> yeah, just at the end of this this slide here, Joy, is where it dropped off. OK, I'm sorry about that, guys. Did I talk about the delete? Did you guys hear the delete part? Yeah. OK, all right then. So. Now that brings us to an example of how to view and clear the salary variance exceeded. Um, you'll notice uh, that this exception means that you've reported for a member, the wages are significantly higher than what has been previously reported for them. And what that means is that the system flags anything above 500%. And this is usually when you have a stipend or a balloon check and from this page, the employer can read a description of what the exception is, and you can click on the exception card to access the page where you can then fix it. So to clear this exception, um, you would need to select a reason for the variance from the drop down and click update. So I'm just going to kind of run through it a little bit. So you'll notice that we're looking at the member. We know they have a salary variance on the right side of the screen down towards the bottom. There says salary variance reason. You would click on that little arrow and that box pops open and it gives you 
a bunch of different reasons why this person might have a salary variance. So you would select the reason of the salary variance and then you would go to the update button circled and click on that. Oops, sorry. After correcting the exception, you can click on the elongated oval shape under the exception card. You'll notice it's circled there. Or you could go back to the exception list and you could mark the box next to the member's name and then you would go to the bottom of the page and click on mark as corrected. Uh, you just want to make sure that you're marking the exceptions corrected uh, once you've done so because they would not be picked up for the next trial process if you did not. All teacher members must be reported with contract information. The contract dates must match up with the contract periods that were previously configured. Contract info can be reported in the file or uploaded separately. When adding new teacher members, employers will see an area where they can add contract information. Salary records will be associated to the contract period rather than the pay period. Employers can check what your contract period is by clicking on the schedules button in the employer reporting menu. So once you've done that, it's gonna pop up to the screen similar to what you're looking at on the slide. And you'll notice the arrow points to the teacher contract periods that were configured for this example for the employer. You'll notice that they have two different ones. So they have one that's a primary and one that's a secondary. If one or more contracts in the reporting file do not match or they don't exist in DRS, the reporting file will reject. But rather than a hard rejection, the file will be marked as waiting for contracts. And then you as the employer can then upload a supplementary teacher contract file, which will correct the existing data. Teacher contracts can be reported in the monthly file. So the reported teacher contract file that if you were to receive that waiting for teacher contracts, you could create that file and in that file, it would have all the info for your teacher members, which would include social security number, begin date, end date, contract salary, pay frequency, and contract type. And then once the file is uploaded, the employer can resubmit the batch. Contract information needs to be associated to each teacher. By opening up an individual teacher member's account, you can see the member's contract information along with their salary and contribution information. So if you're looking at this screen, the arrow points to where you can see the contract information uh, for this particular member. Uh, if you were to click on that card, then you would see the right hand side of the screen and it gives you a little bit more broken down, um, more in depth details about their contract information itself. The exception example here is called a contract salary variance. To resolve this exception, you would have to move a portion of the salary and contributions to a different contract period. In this example, after the contract salary variance exception is generated by comparing it to the prior pay period amount, the user moved $2,000 of the salary to the prior contract period as seen in the arrow on the left side of the screen. This created a pay period adjustment for the last normal pay period in the selected contract period, and that's seen in the arrow on the right side of the screen. Also, the salary and associated contributions are moved as well. 
note that the pay date of the pay period adjustment remains the pay date reported by the employer. Okay, I think this is the point where I'm taking the baton again from Joy, but if you have any questions about uh, any of the stuff she covered, uh, please type them in now and we'll, we'll take a beat for a second while give people a chance to do that. Okay, seeing none, and if any do come in, we'll stop and, and answer them. But um, moving along, uh, back to enrolling new members. I mentioned earlier in the presentation that, um, you know, new hires, uh, the, the new file layout for uh, the, the DRS does have a, a, a place in it uh, where you can report somebody as a new hire. Um, you're payroll vendor hopefully you know program that little indicator or checkbox or whatever, drop down or whatever it's going to look like on your screen uh, into the file if um, they were unable to do that you can still add people um, through the DRS um, later uh, when, once the, the initial um, file is uploaded so you've got a couple ways to do it the easiest one would be through the file um, if you can do it that way um, we will still be requiring the paper enrollment forms during parallel processing in october and november uh, but then we'll be phasing those out um, um, beginning in december uh, question came in parallel reporting for october and november refers to the october and november files that are due in November in uh, no actually parallel will be it's going to be your October reporting which is your September information and then your November reporting which will be your October so September and October are the files you'll be submitting um, in both systems and then come December we'll take the November information just in the new system so um, if you missed adding someone into the file into the file that you uploaded and you want to you need to add them manually into the um, into the system you would go to your batch and click on the batch card and then um, click on view in the batch detail box and that batch detail is going to pop open uh, and there are three choices at the bottom of that detail. One is view members. So you can then click on that and that's going to show you the list of all the, the members in your batch. This, this could be multiple pages if um, if you have a if you're a large employer, uh, but you've got that person you need to add to that month. So what you would do is from this page, you would click add at the bottom of the page. And this is going to bring you to that uh, member information page. I think this, this is where um, in the, in the uh, salary variance exception slide that Joy addressed, it's, this is the same page that goes here. But this, this page, since it's a new member, it's going to show up as blank. So you're going to be putting in uh, the appropriate um, uh, demographic information, name, name, social, et cetera, higher date. Um, you know those those pieces uh, there's a box to check for a new hire if it's a teacher you'll be adding the, the contract period and the pay frequencies as well so you know, basically you're setting up the person and then you're just going to click insert and that um, member will be in the file um so that's that's how that works now Right now, you know, we ask you to send in the paper form. Most people scan it and email it or, you know, securely or, or otherwise to us. And they also include with that um, copies of the, the new hires, a social security or birth certificate, uh, things like that, which, you know, we, we need for our records ultimately when, um, you know, the time comes for that person. Um, so this is, this process is a little, different it's sort of an inversion of what we currently do we're going to want that person reported through the file first okay whether it's you know through the file upload or by adding them and then once the file is posted for that month that person is in our database and there's a record for them so at that point once the once the file is posted you can go back in you and use that upload documents feature in the uh, in the 
the main the menu on the dashboard and then you can uh, look up that member by um, full social or first and last and then attach and upload uh, different documents to that person's file whether that's a social uh, security card or a birth certificate or if it's not a new hire but you've got somebody who got married and changed their name you can upload the marriage certificate and it's it's right already associated with that member's record we get a we get a notification when something like that happens and and we'll review it and make sure it's with the right place and follow up if there's any questions but you know it's a much more secure way to do that than sending email i think we will still be accepting if you email that those other um documents to us at least for now but um you know i think once the transition is complete it becomes you know a little bit easier to do it right through the drs um you know and it, it's a little more streamlined so that that's the, the follow-up on um enrolling members because we had that question about what do i do with those other documents and you know we do appreciate what you do with enrollment i know a lot of you will um you know, refer them to our web page or handouts we may have provided about benefits and things like that. And feel free to keep doing that. Uh, we also do now that we have uh, we've been capturing you know emails for pretty much all the new hires over the last few years, and we do send them a welcome email and mail that out to people we don't have a an email address for. So, but the more we can we can together inform them about um, what's available to through to them through an HRS, uh, the better it is for the member and hopefully have a happier employee. Um, switching gears to um, termination forms, uh, you know, that those are also going away. You can terminate members through your reporting batch. So you've got somebody who's term who terminated last month and you're reporting them the, in the, the file this month. So you, you submit your file as as usual and then you're going to go into the um, batch details view members find the individual member who terminated and click on the detail page for them and then you're going to go to their page going to enter a termination date you know whether it's the middle or the end of the you know whatever pay period that they actually their last day of work that they were paid for uh, and the termination reason you know retirement other uh, you know there's you know whatever you know death whatever whatever the reason is so you're you're reporting that that person is terminated in there so what happens you know with with the termination forms now is you know we'll have their retirement application we get them get them set up to to um to go on on the retiree payroll and we send that term form to you uh, for any of the trailing wages that we may have to add to their pension that you're paying out after they terminate so by terminating the member in the file if they are getting another check from you guys next month you know with sick time or whatever in it um you know whatever whatever is pensionable it you know when when that file is uploaded next month it's going to throw an exception saying hey this person terminated last month what's this for and that triggers the where you would report the separate buckets on the term form so um again a little little more streamlined and, and less passing of paper and things like that so that was the goal with that so that's how you would um terminate a member and then uh, deal with the trailing wages if if there are any afterwards at this point i am going to turn it back over to joy uh, to talk about payment vouchers to submit a payment voucher to New Hampshire Retirement System, you would select the voucher button in the menu. Note that there are two types of payment vouchers. Scheduled vouchers are created automatically and associated to a specific batch number. Unscheduled vouchers are created manually by the retirement system and they are not associated to any one batch. Uns unscheduled batches can be used for payments not related to a batch or a reporting cycle. Here is an example of what you will see after clicking that view button. You'll notice there is a breakdown of payment by tier, group, and subgroup, as well as the payment amount total. So I just want to add, um, I know currently in PGV2, you have to fill out your own voucher and either submit it through the submission or you email it or you send it in with your payment. 
But in B3, after you've reported and you've cleared all your exceptions and the report has posts, the voucher, excuse me, the voucher pre-populates for you. So as long as you're paying that payment amount total, then you would be at net zero for that batch. Okay, a couple of questions came in, Joy. Um, are all, do all terminations need to be done in the batch? And then will we still receive a batch number sheet or is that no longer needed? So two, two questions for you. So uh, I think Marty's slide showed that you could do a termination outside of the reporting batch. Um, if that answers your questions in the slide. Uh, so if you were to click after the batch is posted, I think it has like a view member. You can click on the view member and I believe you were able to put in a term date at that point. And then, so the Badge number sheet, or I'm, I'm guessing you mean the reporting and voucher report. I do have a slide coming up that does mention that report will still be available, but you can also see it yourself if you were to go um, to schedule in the menu, uh, which was on a previous slide, I believe it showed the batch number, the voucher numbers, as well as the contract period. So you'll be able to see it in those two separate places. I'm for now gonna continue if there's no other questions on those items. When the voucher is generated and all voucher detail is saved, it can be submitted simply by clicking the submit button. If the amounts match, the voucher status will say submitted. Once a voucher is submitted, it cannot be modified. However, if any changes need to be made, employers can click a reset, reset link, which will put the voucher back into a status of scheduled or unscheduled. If the amount does not match the sum of the voucher detail amounts, an error will display. And after the payment is made, if you think that you have overpaid, there are reports that can help locate an error that may have caused an overpayment. Contributions are still going to be due to New Hampshire retirement by the 25th of the month. We recommend that all employers use ACH to send payments to New Hampshire Retirement. New Hampshire Retirement is still partnering with Citizens Bank to utilize the NHRS Quick Pay, which is an online bill pay function that facilitates employer contributions by ACH at no cost to the employers. Payments can be scheduled in advance to post right before it's due and it's safe, secure, and free. To learn more about Quick Pay, you can see the NHRS Quick Pay page on our website. But if you already use Quick Pay, you'll notice a slightly different interface this fall as we are adding a field for the batch number, and that's to help improve payment tracking. This next screen is uh, speaking to account adjustments. So if you have an account adjustment, to make, uh, you would go to the menu and you would click on account adjustment. When you do that, you'll the screen that's on the slide is essentially what you're gonna see. And you would start off by having to browse for the, for the member, um, putting in the name and social security number. And once you've done that, you would then click on the type. You'll see that there's three types. There's er erroneous contributions, salary continuance, and salary pay item correction. And I'm gonna go into a little, a little bit of a detail about what each one is. So erroneous contributions is when you need to adjust already reported pays because you find that they were overstated or that you might need a refund. And those were wages that were already posted from your regularly, regular monthly batch. Then we have the salary continuance, and this is when you need to add or report a salary continuance outside of the regular monthly batch reporting. 
and then the save salary pay item correction, which is normally based off an audit finding where you need to move salary buckets. So it's like moving base to comp over or comp over to base. Similar to PGV2, employers can utilize reports in version three. Reports can help in identifying discrepancies, viewing prior batch information, displaying member records, and more. On this slide, we've highlighted a few reports that we think that will be handy to you. The employee listing report, which shows current employees. It can either show all your current active employees, or it can be filtered to show a specific higher date range. We will still have the employer account activity report, which shows the receivable payment and refund transactions for any employer. Employers can filter this report to show a specific plan, batch, date range, or fiscal year. And then lastly, the employer reporting and voucher number report, which shows the batch numbers and voucher numbers that are assigned to scheduled batches and payment vouchers for a fiscal year. Okay, to take us through the home stretch now, um, getting started. So, uh, anyone who is a current uh, user of the DRS um, will be able to use their sign on credentials um, to set up an account in the new system. So, what you're going to need is your username, password, and your and your email address associated with 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 your account in the current system. And there's going to be a button on the login page for the for the new system where you'll be able to um, use your other other passwords to get in and set up your account uh, there'll be steps after you use that you'll be setting up um, you know um, um, challenge questions um, you know if you'll forget your password uh, uh, multi-factor authentication things like that and we'll have instructions on how that is going to work um, you know be, before we go live so you'll be able to to do that process um if you just want to be careful if you end up you know having to change your password um you know in in um you know september or you know or something like that the the it's not going to work porting it over you'd have to call us and we can get you set up um so don't don't, don't save your password unless it forces don't, don't change your password unless it forces you to um for new people who aren't on the current system but you know future hires that you have or or uh people you're you're beginning to assign an hrs reporting task to with your organization um similar to the current system there's a form to uh fill out and send in uh, authorizing access for somebody and they'll get an email um to set up their account um, so that that's how that will work for new folks. So we'll have we'll have instructions both for setting up a new person and setting up uh, an existing user in the new DRS that we'll be posting. So we expect I don't have an exact date on when the new DRS is going to open up. Uh, we obviously before October 15th, but again we're uh, still working with the vendor on on the um, all of the all of the dates, and we'll we'll get those out to you as soon as they're firmed up. That, that answers Kim's question. Um, now, however, you know, we do want you to be comfortable and familiar with the new system. So we are going to be setting up a test environment, which we're calling the sandbox um, for employers who want to log in and, you know, click on the links, you know, maybe adjust a member record, you know, check out a voucher, things like that. This, this is a this is a complete test environment. It's not um connected to anybody's actual records or anything so um, it's not going to mess anything up if you play around with it or if you just want to click through and, and look at the different screens and, and sort of familiarize yourself with the interface you know so uh, a lot of people are, are tend to be hands-on learners and it's a little bit easy to, to work things through if they you know they can start clicking on it and stuff like that so um we're going to be uh, deploying the sandbox. It's probably going to be available for about a month, beginning sometime the last week in August uh, into late September. Uh, and we'll be sending an email to employers uh, about um, 
when that when that's available it'll have instructions on how to set up your account the 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 account you'll be able to use your version two credentials to sign into the sandbox just like you will into the new system so um you know signing in it, it gives you a good dry run on setting up your account you know and all the steps involved in that plus plus getting into it so there's no um mandatory requirement to use the sandbox but um you know we would encourage you to just to you know poke around um with that so we'll, again we'll be sending stuff out on that um question came in salary continuance is this the same as short-term disability paper forms that we currently submit if the employer is on std is paid in full through payroll and not paid offline from a third party do we still have to report um I'll leave that one to Joy after reading it out loud. Um. Who probably has her mic on mute. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I was I, I was typing it because I didn't want to interrupt you, but I can just kind of speak to it real quick. So um, essentially the process is still sort of staying the same. So however you kind of do it now, it's, the same so if you report some of it in your regular monthly batch you would still do that if you don't and you do it outside of your batch usually just a form with a payment that's when you would be using the account adjustment uh screen that i just showed um and you would be clicking on salary continuance does that make sense did that answer your question so to speak Uh, if you have like a follow up and that didn't, if that didn't fully answer, you can um, email the PGV3 DRS Robin and I can try to go into a little bit more specific um, offline with you if you'd like. Perfect, perfect lead in to the next slide, which is, um, you know, we have a page uh, with the resources for employers on here. It's got an email dedicated for the project and other other information and sub information and sub pages on there. Um, you know, we've had the page for a couple of years and I've sent out links. Hopefully you've all seen it. But just as a reminder, this is where you'll get the most up to date information um, on there. Um, and if you do have questions, the email that Joy was referring to uh, is um, pgv3drs at nhrs.org. So if you have questions, um, just shoot them to that email and we'll answer them in the order in which they are received. Um, the reporting exceptions um, hotline and email is the same and it's going to stay the same in the new system. The same folks who are handling or working with you on your files now or um, have been trained and are, are getting ramped up on version three. Um, we're also going to have the vendor on site um, for, for much of the first um, couple of months. So uh, for troubleshooting, if, if it's a question that, that we're not familiar with, we should be able to work with the vendor to get it resolved uh, for you um, in a timely manner. Um, you know, we will be uh, much more lenient uh, on uh, penalty assessments and things during this transition. Obviously, we're we're asking a lot of you with double reporting for two months and then using the new system. Um, so um, we'll be, um, you know, kind of kind of kind of taking the pedal off that. We we're pretty soft as it is with that, but um, I think we'll be even even more of a marshmallow in terms of assessing employer penalties in the first few months. Um, DRS support uh, number and email here. This is for people who are having trouble logging in. Uh, they, you know, it's not working for them. That's that's about the extent of what the folks at that number can do for you. Or if you have a new person setting up, that's where you'd send the form to. And then the general employer resources page that we've had that is um, still there. We've got the instructions on reporting and clearing exceptions and things on the current system on that page for now those will go away come december and we'll be putting all the new stuff replacing it with the new instructions for the new system only on that page um, that does bring us to the 